we have come to the sacred assembly of the Day of Atonement. I hope all our family members in Zion receive the amazing grace of atonement from God. May God bless you abundantly during the feast. During this afternoon service as well, let us continue to think about God's profound grace and boundless compassion to make atonement for our sins. Let us also think about how the faith of the early church grew so rapidly. It was only when the saints fully realized the sacrifice of Christ who died on the cross did the gospel work of the early church greatly prosper. Let us take some time to study about this matter. Today's sermon is titled, Who Shall Separate Us from the Love of Christ? Let us take a look at Romans chapter 8. Apostle Paul realized the profound love and sacrifice demonstrated by Christ through the cross. Let us look at the scene in verse 33, where he passionately explained to the saints in Rome that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his letter to the church in Rome, Apostle Paul confessed his faith toward God and wrote, Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Since the saints deeply understood the meaning of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, weren't they able to keep their faith until the end? despite severe persecution, hindrance, and insult from the Roman Empire? The saints of the early church realized the divine love of God who shed His blood on the cross. Understanding this mindset and faith of the apostles of the early church, let us look at the path they walked throughout their life of faith. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Despite hardships and the danger of being thrown into prison, Paul did not succumb to the situation, but overcame it in order to preach the gospel. Verse 24, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Then, how did the saints of the early church come to have such faith? We need to understand the motivation and circumstances that allowed them to have such faith. Let's go to Acts chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 10. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. <laughs> 
When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. By looking at the words in chapter 20 and chapter 21, we can see a glimpse of the attitude and mindset that the early church members had when they carried out the mission given by Christ. What was the source of the fervent mindset and faith that the saints of the early church had? Shouldn't there be an explanation for how they came to have such faith? If they had preached simply because others were doing it, they would not have endured for a long time. Rather, the saints of the early church preached because they were able to fully understand and realize God's sacrifice. To make atonement for our sins, God came to the earth, leaving His glorious throne in heaven, being humiliated on the cross. Though His power is great enough to change the situation, He willingly chose that path and suffered to save us. After realizing God's amazing grace, understanding why He lives such a life, the saints of the early church fervently participated in the mission of Christ to save the world. There was nothing that could stop the zeal of their faith. They were ridiculed, put in prison, bound in chains, stoned, even slayed by the sword. Sometimes they went about in sheepskins or goatskins and were thrown out to lions in the Colosseum of Rome. The Roman soldiers lifted them up on stakes poured oil on them, and then lit them on fire from their feet like human candles. They were tormented in all kinds of ways. Yet nothing could stop the faith of the saints of the early church. It was all because they fully understood the profound grace in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. They truly realized. They were able to have such faith because of their deep realization. However, in artificial faith cannot endure for long. Thus, we should first understand and realize God's love. Let's continue by going to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to have the eyes to correctly perceive Christ, who came to the earth to save us. When we come to understand the sacrificial life of Christ, we can also have the same kind of faith the early saints had. We too will be able to continue preaching the gospel despite unfavorable situations, persecution, or trials. Let's continue with verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. What did He do in regard to the cross? He accepted and endured the cross. It is because that was the only way for Him to save and redeem His loving children, granting them the forgiveness of sins. Who, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when He rebukes you. If mankind were to understand all that is written about Christ's sacrifice in these verses, they would regard any suffering, persecution, or trouble in their life of faith as something insignificant. 
to make atonement for our sins, Heavenly Father and Mother endured the passion of the cross to forgive our countless sins from heaven. They suffered on our behalf as the reality of all the animals that had been sacrificed over 1,500 years in the Old Testament times. Through this Day of Atonement, if we too realize this profound love and sacrifice of our father and mother, shouldn't we be able to do the same works that the saints of the early church did? Why wouldn't we be able to have the same faith of the early saints? Some create their faith only in their minds, imagining situations based on letters in the Bible. However, when they encounter an actual situation to test their artificial faith, it will completely collapse. This is why all the saints of the early church took great pride in participating in Christ's suffering and regarded it as a great honor. They greatly rejoiced, saying, I am now regarded as worthy to participate in the suffering of Christ. Let's continue with 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. It says that suffering is the armor of our faith. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Doesn't this mean that we should forsake the way we lived our lives in the past as Gentiles? Verse 4. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to Him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. God awakened us, saying, Since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in what do you participate? In the sufferings of Christ. Christ endured sufferings only to save us. This is why we should rejoice by participating in Christ's sufferings for the salvation of those who will soon come to the truth. Let's see verse 13 one more time. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Here, we can see different kinds of sufferings that we will face while living a Christian life. To those who understand the true meaning of Christ's love and sacrifice, they do not regard their suffering 
as true suffering. Suffering can never hinder or damage their faith, even in the slightest way. Let's go to chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you, what will he make you? Strong. In another version, perfect, firm, and steadfast. Only when we participate in Christ's suffering can we be made perfect. Will Himself restore you and make you strong. In other words, perfect, firm, and steadfast. This is why, according to our situations, we are temporarily given a certain amount of suffering. Whenever Apostle Paul faced suffering, he repeatedly emphasized the point, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution? Since Paul already realized God's grace and love contained in his atoning sacrifice, he was determined to live and even die for Christ. Paul continuously confessed his faith in Acts chapter 20 and 21. As for us, no matter what kind of trouble and hardship befall us, we should not regard them as difficulties. Rather, let us reflect how long our God had to suffer to forgive our sins. He must have had such a burden to carry all that pain and sorrow by Himself. How great His affliction must have been! How can any hardship or suffering that I have ever endured even compare? Shouldn't we think about our suffering in comparison to the suffering God had to undergo? This is why Paul said to the saints of the early church, Throw away all your childish ways from the past. Let us all leave such a childish faith behind. God did not forsake or despise us even when we were sinners. Though God could have let us die in our sin, He Himself came to this earth to be sacrificed as a burnt offering, giving up His glory and throne in heaven. Whenever we think about God's love for us, we ought to think, what am I that God clothed me with such tremendous love and grace? What am I that He left the glory of heaven behind and came to the earth to seek my pitiful soul? How did He willingly accept the heavy burden of the cross and live in such agony and sorrow for me? With this kind of realization, Paul said, How can I betray the love of Christ? Even if people threaten us with swords or we are stricken by famine, Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ. Once we understand this immense love of God, we will be able to practice a faith that the world will not be worthy of. Even if someone imitates the life of the saints superficially, their faith cannot last long. Reality will soon expose them and their faith will be shattered. This is why it is necessary for us to discover and realize the boundless love and divine sacrifice of God. Before we conclude, let us see one more verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. On this Day of Atonement, and whenever our faith wavers, let us remember the sorrow, agony, and pain that God endured to forgive our sins. Let us not be shaken because of our lack of knowledge and childish faith, but proclaim 
who shall dare separate us from the love of Christ? With this mindset and faith, let us become the children of Zion who can complete the last mission of the gospel throughout the world. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, how did I talk? I talked like a child. How did I think? I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, what must I do? I put childish ways behind me. In the past, though we were living a life of faith, we did not know why we needed to believe in God or why we should endure sufferings. Before, we lived without knowing the love of Christ or God's grace. Now, however, as we have come to know the love of Christ, our faith has been transformed so that we can declare who shall dare separate us from the love of Christ. When we had faith like that of a child, we talked, thought, and expressed ourselves understanding things like a child. We practiced our faith with the immaturity of a child, not knowing why we had to go to church. This is why we only came to church when someone picked us up. Yet once we realized the love of God, we should not be those whose faith depends on anyone else. When we were young, the way we thought, talked, and understood things was like a child. However, by understanding the love of God, we are born again as mature adults. When we carry out the gospel and take care of brothers and sisters with God's loving heart, we will never grow tired. On the contrary, if we do the gospel work without a loving heart, we become unmotivated and our feet become heavy. In this case, we would only be mimicking the life of faith of others and everything would feel burdensome. Today, on the Day of Atonement, let us engrave in our hearts once again the magnificent love that God granted to us through this feast. Father and mother were sacrificed as a sin offering. They left behind their glorious thrones in heaven and bestowed upon us heavenly children such a profound grace, though we committed such grievous sins. Then, for father and mother, who have sacrificed so much, how can we possibly repay them? Since God wants everyone to repent, I earnestly hope that we, as sinners who have already repented, can devote our hearts and minds to the work of leading all mankind to repentance. By this, I conclude the sermon for the Day of Atonement. Thank you very much.